I'm Harry Glurkian, and this is Moneyball Medicine, the interview podcast where we meet researchers, entrepreneurs, and physicians who are using the power of data to improve patient health and make healthcare delivery more efficient. You can think of each episode as a new chapter in the never-ending audio version of my 2017 book, Moneyball Medicine, Thriving in the New Data-Driven Healthcare Market. Jason, welcome to the show. Harry, it's great to be here. Thank you. Um, it's been great talking to you and getting to know you. Uh, I feel like we, we should be doing this over a beer and we should be talking for hours. Um, and my, I'm sure my 19-year-old would be like, you want to go to Germany? Let's go to Germany because he loves coming there and having beers when, when, uh, when we've done it in the past. Um, molecular cartography, I, I feel like, you know, Galileo is about to like, you know, step into this conversation with us. But for those people who don't, who aren't molecular biologists, it, 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 it'd be great if you could sort of paint the bigger picture for us and, and help us understand what is, what is this concept of, I think, spatial trans, transcriptomics, I almost like stuttered on my words, and why is it important? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question, Harry. And so again, thanks for the invite to join the, uh, the podcast. So um, context matters. Let's start with that statement. Reading a book without understanding the context makes it a difficult book to read. And if you think about our genome, the DNA that makes us similar and unique, it's a book. And right now, we don't have full context of what that book is. And Resolve Biosciences is a company that's focused on creating tools to help give context to the genome. And so let me explain that a bit. So the central dogma of biology is DNA, which is in your cells, is made into RNA. And that RNA is then translated into proteins. And those proteins are, in essence, what makes you you. It's your muscle, it's your hair, it's your skin, it's your organ systems, and so on. And we understand the book pretty well from the letters A, C, G, and T. And we've been in an exponential phase of learning as it pertains to the genome. In companies such as Illumina, it's a San Diego-based biotech company, has created a technology that allows us to sequence the entire human genome, so every letter in your genome, we can do that now in a couple of days and for a couple hundred dollars. And we need to keep that in context. You know, the first genome took like <laughs> I, I remember <laughs> years and seven billion dollars to do it. As a matter of fact, you know, this is the anniversary of that event happening, right? Yep. Yep. So, so we've really learned a lot about the core code of the genome. But yet disease, chronic disease, still exists in our population. And so we have to ask the question, what else do we need to understand? And we at Resolve believe that the next question is really to understand where different genetic events are occurring within a cell. The interesting thing, the big question in biology is largely we all have the same DNA in our body. You know, humans are remarkably, remarkably homologous, and the variation yeah. between humans is, is very, very little. But yet, we have individuals who are six and a half feet tall, we have individuals that are four feet tall, we have individuals that weigh, you know, 250 yep. pounds, we have individuals that weigh 90 pounds. And so, why? And even more perplexing is we have diseases such as cancer, where two women can present with a very similar breast tumor. One, or they both can be treated with a very similar treatment, identical drugs, and one can go into complete remission and eventually be cured, and the other cannot and potentially right. die. And so the question is, why does that happen? And that has to come down to a number of different variables that we can't yet measure. And so our belief at Resolve Biosciences is, we are going to develop tools to help understand those differences. And that's really the mission. 
So um, let's, I mean, I'm trying to paint a picture for people that are listening to this, right? So I think of this as, because I feel like I've been to at least part of this movie before when I started in immunohistochemistry, where we could actually visualize, you know, rather than grinding up a bunch of cells and looking at fentanyls and, you know, in breast cancer, we were able to actually stain the cells with antibodies that would specifically show us, you know, different parts of a cell that were lighting up. And that was you know, sort of a flat file way to look at it with a certain level of resolution. And you're, I think, zooming in to the molecular level now and taking it to a different resolution. Absolutely. So um, that's a that's a great point. And let me build on that one just a bit. And so, so immunohistochemistry opened the books to understand different types of disease states where you can start profiling cell types and understand where they are in the cell cycle, which can be indicators for physicians or pathologists to prescribe a particular therapeutic, right? We take that even to another degree. Um, I'll use an analogy, it's perhaps overused, but think about Google Maps. So mm -hmm. you know, Google Maps allows you to start at the continent or globe level and then focus into a country, focus into a state, focus into a city, focus into a street, and even focus right. into the backyard, right? So our technology, the molecular cartography platform, is similar in that we can take single cells or we can take tissue slices. And through our molecular biology approach, we can label individual RNA transcripts. So going back to that DNA makes RNA makes protein, we can go in and identify specific RNA molecules that code for a known protein. We can label those molecules and with high power microscopy and molecular biology and very importantly, software, <laughs> we, can, we can then identify and literally visualize individual RNA transcripts in the context of the cell and tissue. So now going back to that Google Maps analogy, we now have that woman who has the unfortunate breast tumor. We can put sections of that breast tumor on a slide. We can use our molecular cartography technology to be able to look at the gene expression patterns within that tumor. And those patterns can give insights to researchers and eventually to clinicians in how to affect and treat that disease state. Very, very powerful. So I, I we're talking about essentially creating a, a three-dimensional map of these cells and which ones are lighting up, which ones are not lighting up, how they affect each other, basically intercommunication between these cells. And intracommunication inside the cell as well. So, so where, where are you? How far are you in this, I guess, is the first question. Yeah, yeah, great, great question. So um, this journey didn't just start. And so this journey started in 2016 when we at a previous company thought about this challenge of spatial biology. Again, you know, we have sequenced genomes, but yet cancer persists in the population. And we were asking questions, what's the next answer that needs to be brought to science? And so in 2016, we brought together a, a truly gifted group of scientists to come up with solutions to be able to look at the spatial relationship of gene expression within cells and tissue. Um, and since the 2016 inception of the project, we've now been able to take bench science and automate bench science to a point where we can now run hundreds of samples, looking at thousands of genes in a fully automated process. So you're building on this existing technique of single, mo single molecule RNA fluorescence, right? And so, and, and this is, I don't, you know, it's nothing new, right? This is a technique that's been out there. I guess the question is, is what are the fundamental advances that Resolve is, you know, bringing to the table or your version of sure. this that, that is uniquely powerful? Yeah, great, great question. So, um, so as you said, our technology is 
what's generally referred to as a single molecule fish technology, fluorescent in situ hybridization, which means we label RNA with a fluorophore, and then we can image that RNA using high power optics. And so um, there are numerous approaches to look at labeling RNAs, and there are numerous challenges in doing that. We have come up with a novel, and of course, because we're a biotech company, a patented process that gives us protection. <laughs> yeah. um, we have a process that allows us to, through combinatory labeling of the RNAs, allows us to identify very diverse RNAs. Because the challenge is, is that when you want to label something, you have to attach a probe to it. And yep. in the genome or the transcriptome, there's a lot of repetitive sequences that are similar. And you need to be able to discern the difference between gene A and gene B, and they could be very, very homologous or very, very similar. Our technology allows us to use small but very different probes to tile across that, that target, that RNA of interest. And then by selectively colorizing and decolorizing those probes, we create, in essence, a color pattern. And that right. color pattern is imaged, and then we use software to deconvolute or decode those images, so we can then see individual transcripts within the cell. It's funny. I feel like my, you know, history has a way of building on itself. I mean, I remember when we were doing DNA in situ hybridization and trying to convince people that this was going to be something, and then, you know, molecular barcodes when I was at Applied Biosystems. So this is the culmination in, in a sense, an advancement obviously because of software and imaging and those sorts of things of this next stage of where this technology is taking us. Indeed, indeed. I think um, that's, a, that's a great analogy, great, great example. And you see this kind of, you know, you see this, this trajectory of single cell biology and, you know, transcriptomics is a great example of that. You know, we started with RNA, uh, you know, RNA blots, doing what's called a northern blot. And, you know, <laughs> me, you know, in grad school, we're doing northern blots, where we're even using, you know, radio to label the, uh, the RNA within a northern blot. I still have all my fingers, even with all the isotope I used in, in, in grad school. And so um, you've gone from very crude techniques to a much more refined technique and Illumina through their next generation sequencing brought on uh, an amazing technology called RNA-seq or rna yes. sequencing. Of course, RNA-seq kind of back to your earlier analogy is you grind everything up and then you read all of the transcripts. The problem is, is you don't know what transcript came from where, you know, you right. just got this huge gamish of, <laughs> of transcripts and you got to, Kind of say, well, this is a transcript that's associated with this gene, and that gene is associated with this kind of cell type. And then a couple of years ago, a company called 10x Genomics came up mm -hmm. with a to take single cells. So instead of had that, uh, say, that fruit smoothie with everything ground up, they took the pieces of fruit and just kind of laid them out in the line. And what they right. did is encapsulated those cells into a droplet and then did the sequencing reaction in that droplet. You still have a kind of a mixed population there. And then through software, they would separate out the different cells. We now take that to the next, next level where we just look at the fruit salad. Instead of that fruit smoothie or the lined up fruits, we can now look at the fruit salad. And we can say, oh yeah, cantaloupe is touching apple, which is touching you know, orange. And geez, yeah. every apple and orange are next to each other. The fruit salad falls apart really quickly. Going back to the analogy of breast cancer, when we have these interactions, these patients don't survive. So maybe we need to look differently at the drug that's targeting that interaction. So that's how we want to think about you know, these problems and how we can move them forward. Well, like you said, I mean, context matters, location matters, right? As, as a guy who's got IP and location-based services, location is a big deal, right? <laughs> People don't realize everything revolves around location uh, at some point. And yes. having context to it, really adds another dimensionality of information that all of a sudden your eyes open up to what could be going on or why something matters. For sure, for sure. And this is, I mean, again, you, and I, I keep going back to the oncology use case, but you know, oncology is a, a blight that is all over the world and affects all human beings at some point. Um, and the concept, you know, a tumor is not a homogeneous mass of cells. 
you know, tumors are heterogeneous. The cells that are in the interior of the tumor are different than the cells on the exterior of the tumor. The blood vessels that innervate the tumor look different than blood vessels that are adjacent to the tumor. And we call this the tumor microenvironment. What is going on inside that tumor? And, you know, coming up with the drug that can just permeate the tumor and kill it from the inside out, whether it's hypoxia and you starve it of, of oxygen so it can no longer grow, or maybe encapsulating the tumor so that it can't grow and dies outside in. We just don't have a lot of visibility right now to the genetics that's happening within that microenvironment. And this is an area where molecular cartography just shines a spotlight onto that tumor microenvironment. Well, I'm also thinking, as you get to know these different cell types and the call it the color pattern that they're giving, you can almost create a fingerprint. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. And this right. is the thing about um, the molecular cartography platform. I mean, uh, when you think about um, kind of science and you look at the different areas of science, on one side of the spectrum, you have the basic science research. This is the hypothesis formation. You just don't know what's going on and you have to do experiments, you know, continually to refine and develop a hypothesis. On the opposite side of that spectrum is clinical testing. When you're looking for a yes, no, almost a binary type of answer, right? And the stops between there are areas such as translational research, where you take your hypothesis and you refine it to a use case that's specific to a disease, right? And then from your translational research, you move to clinical research where you're really applying that hypothesis in large populations. Yeah, but, but let's, 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 and maybe agree to disagree or just agree, but I remember that taking dog years, yes. like in, in the old days, right? And I feel like because of innovation, because of being able to do the analytics on technology, you know, on the, on the data, um, that time is almost collapsing in on itself. It is. Uh, you know, uh, there are advancements that seem to be, ha I I'm having trouble keeping up with the literature. For sure. <laughs> Absolutely. There's, there's no question about it. There's no question about it. The rate of scientific innovation, you know, it's like Moore's law backwards, right? I mean, it just kind of continues just to just, just, you know, keep, keep accelerating and accelerating and accelerating. And you know, tools, again, going back to next generation sequencing has provided so much data that we're still behind in the data backlog and understanding what exactly these data are gonna say. But you know, the iterative cycles are becoming faster cycles as new tools come online. You can really test and, and tweak and adjust your hypothesis at a scale that you haven't been able to do before. But at the end of the day, you still have to get a patient population. And you have to get a patient population that all exhibits the same phenotype, right? Yes. And so, so there still is massive inefficiency within, within the discovery, especially drug discovery process. Technologies like molecular cartography can help, again, collapse some of those inefficiencies as well. Yeah, I mean, but if you think about like, uh, you know, at JP Morgan, they announced, uh, Illumina announced, like, we're going to take sequencing down to, quote, $60 is our goal. You know, like at 60 bucks, it's a rounding error. Like, why wouldn't you, why wouldn't everybody... <laughs> Like well, if, if you had <laughs> so um, uh, Elaine Martis, who is a true thought leader in the world of genomics, Elaine is uh, at uh, Cincinnati Kids and previously was at Wash U, um, really at the tip of the spear in, in cancer genetics. Uh, she said a statement once that I, I still remember that makes me smile. You know, it might be the thousand dollar genome, but it's the hundred thousand dollar analysis of that genome, right? And so, so. But but we can, we can I, I'm looking at so many things right now from an analytics perspective that are even making that easier. Sure, no question. I mean, again, the you know, machine learning is helping us sift through reams of data, understand what's not important and what is important. And with all of the data that's being generated, you have huge training sets, right? Massive training sets that you right. can put your algorithms at. Um, and you've seen success in a lot of a lot of areas. You know, look at companies like Flatiron, and look at companies like Foundation Medicine, right? You know, I think that that you know Foundation Medicine is a, a brilliant example of a big data analytics company masquerading as an assay company, right? Well, yeah, I mean, and it's the same thing. I was talking to to uh, Joel Dudley over at Tempest, and 
you know, they're planning on being not just having the most information across different methodologies, right? Uh, transcriptome, methylation, et cetera, from every single sample, but they're also creating the piping to be the AWS so that why would you go anyplace else but their platform? So they're not just giving you an answer, they're giving you a whole infrastructure, which is, that doesn't sound like a typical biological company. It sounds like a tech company to a certain degree. Well, I mean, you know, the lines blur very, very quickly. You know, I look at, at what we are doing at Resolve Biosciences and I have as many computational scientists, informaticians, you know, uh, bioinformaticians as I do wet lab biologists because yeah use the overused analogy of data is the new gold, right? And you need to be able to, to dig in and understand what's going on. And we need to also help our customers understand these complex data sets that we generate. Yeah, go and try and explain that to all of our brethren, Jason. Come on. I mean, uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I was, I was on a call, you know, last night where, you know, everybody's deep into the biology. I'm like, I think you guys are missing this other thing that's moving like a freight train, right? That That's changing the... And the interesting part is, is when I'm interviewing people is the data is highlighting some things where even the world expert goes, I would have never thought about that. Yep. I would have never looked at it that way had it not been highlighted to me um, by this system. Indeed. Indeed. You know, you're, you're describing, uh, you know, I, I love when my customers see the data for the first time that comes off the molecular cartography platform. I really like to be with them. And unfortunately, in coronavirus today, being with them <laughs> on Zoom or Teams, but I prefer to be in the room with them because most everybody has a very, very similar response where you watch them and they have a hypothesis in their head and they're looking for the data to validate the hypothesis, right? Yep. You can watch their eyes, go to the image, you can see them scan the image looking for something and then Almost uniformly, I hear this, just that little breath as they breathe in and they're just like, oh my gosh, there's an answer. And then we show them some bioinformatic tools to start looking at the data in a different way. And then you see that kind of sit back and go, I get it. I really well, that's where, I mean, it's funny because I was trying to write this book and I think I'm going to have to leave it to the, to the next one, be, you know, before this third one uh, or after this third one comes out is, I think the whole paradigm because of the analytics we can do is being shifted in the reverse. In other words, it's almost like the, the machine should present something that then you can figure out where you should develop your hypothesis as opposed to develop the hypothesis because yeah. there's just too much data to analyze, right? Yeah. Here I'm smiling because I have, so when I think about developing software, and I've been developing software in life science for much of my career, um, you know, there's a couple of pillars that are important in, in my view in software development and the features you bring into software. One of those pillars is transparency. You know, black boxes don't go far in science. Scientists, by definition, are technologists. They want to understand the knobs and the dials that are under the hood. They yep. may not want adjust them themselves, the advanced ones want to be adapted, but they just want to understand, you know, where are the limits? What are you calling? What are you not calling? But the other element, and this is an element where I think the industry has largely missed, and you're hitting on right here, is the concept of guiding. The concept of guiding the customer to insights and outcomes. And even if you're wrong in your guidance, you're stimulating that scientist to think because yeah. of that that scientists may not have thought about that hypothesis or that answer. And so by proposing the next step, by proposing how that hypothesis could be tweaked, you're stimulating thought that may not have previously existed. And I find this to be a very, very powerful tool. And this is where, you know, tools like artificial intelligence and machine learning are critically important because you need those non-biased systems to come in and start looking at the data and making calls. And then you use your bias system, the gray matter, to judge those calls and challenge your thoughts. Well, yeah, but that's not the way that we're taught, right? We're supposed to go in with the answer, go in with the miraculous hypothesis of this is absolutely gonna change. And I just find, you know, 
it's like predicting the weather. I mean, there's just too many factors for any one human being to go like, you know, that's the trigger. Oh, absolutely. So, totally so let's get back to the to the technology. Like your technology, like uh, I think I remember reading, it's like a 0.27 micron resolution, which I, I think is, if I read correctly, 10 times higher than some of the competitors. Um, how do you, how do you, I mean, you can't tell me the secret sauce, but how do you get to that sort of resolution? Is it, I mean, it's got to be a combination of hardware and software to a certain degree. I mean, our, our resolution limit is the diffraction limit of light. And the diffraction limit of light being, again, we, we image individual RNA transcripts. You know, these are very, very small, couple hundred base pair, you know, couple hundred mm -hmm. nucleotide pieces of genetic material. And so our resolution allows us to discriminate two dots, two different transcripts that are sitting close to each other at that 0.27 micron um, range, which again is the, the limit of light to be able to separate those two photons from themselves. And so we are pushing the absolute edge of optics, the ability to detect these events. There are other techniques that we're exploring that would allow us to even go beyond that, like super resolution microscopy. But with that, there's trade-offs. Of course, as you zoom in, you lose larger fields of view and you got to kind of manage that. You know, the analogy is a squishy balloon, right? You squish it on one end, it pops up on the other and, and vice versa. Yeah, you almost wish you could layer them on top of each other and create the zoom we were talking about with the Google map. Yeah, I mean, so in essence, that's what we do. So we, we take a slice or cells that are on a slide, um, you know, and we image through that individual cell layer and we stop at very, very fine, thin slices. So, you know, when you affix the tissue to the slide, you're looking at micron thick tissue. Well, we right. go in and we build stacks on top of that. So you can then... You can actually see when we image the top of the floor and kind of like as you think about a basketball, right? As you slice through a basketball, we see it, the dot when it's really small, we see the dot as it gets larger, then it meets its maximum and goes back down to its, its typical. I always have a vision when I, when I talk to people about these technologies that sort of create the maps is, uh, you know, wearing a VR lens and being able to like look at it spatially, which would be I've, I've tried to encourage a couple of the people and some of the companies of you need to have some of your, cause you might see something through that that you might not see through a normal methodology. There's no question about it. The other thing that we need to keep in mind and you know, as a, a 50 year old scientist, it's difficult to always think about who my customers are, which are non 50 year old scientists or the postdocs and grad students that are going to become the next leaders in science. Um, you know, everybody talks about digitization, you know, that's kind of granted that things are moving to digital, but we can't ignore macro trends such as augmented reality and virtual reality, right? I no. mean, that's, that's even, even me being a dinosaur, I've got an Oculus. Of course, I have a nine-year-old and 11-year-old as well. <laughs> but, you know, I, at one point in my career, I worked for a company uh, called Sigma Aldrich, and Sigma is now owned by Merck. Um, but Sigma Aldrich was a leading company in fine organics for right. medical chemistry, you know, high throughput, uh, you know, synthesis of, of pharmaceutical compounds. And 20 years ago, you would walk into the chemi informatics suite and you'd see people with these huge honking goggles on as they're looking at structure function relationships. They've got molecules. How do you dock molecules onto proteins? Biology surprisingly hasn't kept up. You know, how many biological tools are using augmented reality, virtual reality right now? There aren't. No, and I, I mean, I've been, I've been attending and going to different talks from the tech world, right? At the entertainment world, yes. right? And looking at the boundaries they're pushing and then imagining that in our world. Yes. And the opportunities are mind-blowing. They are. It's just our world. <laughs> doesn't think about it that way. But when we think about, again, the molecular cartography platform, so, you know, why did we call it molecular cartography, right? The cartographers were the explorers of the new world. 
You know, they were the folks that went out and mapped the world so everybody could follow behind and find the riches, the land, the bounty, and so on. So when we think about how we want to build a map, if we only think about building a map for a single person, we're losing that race. And tools like augmented reality and virtual reality have future in our technology. And Harry, I see a day and not far away where not only will we be able to look at these beautiful images that we create in this three-dimensional space where you can sit, put your goggles on and look around at your subcellular structure of your cells and see the transference. But more importantly, my collaborator in Zurich can join me on that journey. And we can collaborate you know, virtually, but yet looking at a actual scientific experiment underway. You then take that to the next level and get into therapeutic approaches or clinical approaches where a pathologist and a general practitioner can explore the tumor biology of the patient. It is a complete paradigm destroying proposition. Well, I'm also, I'm just thinking about, man, if you put that into the education system in a different way to have people look at this, yeah. right? Um, as well as superimpose tools from, you know, the artificial intelligence world to sort of highlight different things that the machine might be able to, that, that now you're talking about really seeing where you could drive diagnosis, treatment, therapy, yep. you know, uh, making new drugs, um, or for that matter, I mean, you know, we, we have these big projects that talk about the tra transcriptome and the genome, but we should have one around this cartography area. Although I, I'm sort of struggling to figure out whether how consistent the map would be. Um, well, I mean, so the but, point is we need to build maps of every tissue type and every disease state. And this is where, again, the ability to harness software to help us interpret those maps is gonna be critically important. So one element where we use software in our, in our uh, workflow um, and machine learning is in identifying cell types. And so, you know, most neurons look the same or have a similar, you know, phenotype to those neurons. So yeah. right, right now there's inefficiency in a lot of biology because in essence, we use channels to identify a cell type and that channel is then occupied identifying the cell type. What if we could free that channel up to identify more, say, disease-specific genes? And so to do that, we need to still be able to identify the cell type. So we need to train algorithms to be able to look at tens of thousands, millions of slices of brain to be able to identify the neurons, the different cells within the brain, so that when we put it into our instruments, we don't have to use a channel to identify a neuron. We use all of our channels to identify disease state genes. And then we use machine learning and vision learning to be able to overlay, okay, that's a neuron because it looks like this and we've got 57,000 data sets that support this. Feels like facial recognition in a crowd. Yeah, you know, it's, it, it, it is. And then we take it to another level when we now start phenotyping disease states. Yeah. So, you know, We've just finished an early access program with the molecular cartography platform. And we looked at you know, a number of different disease states, one of them being Alzheimer's disease. So it's a disease my grandmother passed away from. And I'll tell you, I think most people listening to the podcast have had someone in their life who was impacted by Alzheimer's disease. Um, devastating disease that steals the person in front of you. And you know, we have been able to make mouse models that have, you know, tank cow tangles and amyloid plaques, and we can demonstrate Alzheimer's disease, but yet, you know, as well as I, nearly every company that's been in a phase three clinical trial for an Alzheimer's drug has failed out. <laughs> yes. You have to ask, why is that happening, right? What are we missing? Because even within those trials, people are looking at different approaches to address that. And so, we partner with a major pharma company to use our technology to look at amyloid plaques in a way they haven't been able to do before. To look at an amyloid plaque and then as a, as a temporospatial approach, being able to identify a plaque and look at the cascading impacts of different genes that are expressed in proximity to the plaque itself. 
to say, you know, right now we have been focused on the plaque. Well, let's take that sphere a little further and let's focus on the microenvironment around the plaque and understand what is causing the plaque to grow, what are elements, what are genes that are in play that we could potentially target from the therapeutic area. And if we see high levels of expression, what happens if we turn that expression down? Can we get that plaque to stop growing? More importantly, could we get that plaque to actually shrink in size? And so a lot of these really interesting questions that previously were difficult to ask and answer, our cartography platform is now allowing some unique insights. And so uh, it's a great study. We're writing a manuscript right now, and I, I look forward to being back on the podcast talking about some new <laughs> That'll be great. I mean, I, you know, I, I have talked to some of those companies, and I think one of the biggest problems is, you know, the guy that looks at Im images is used to looking at images. The person that works in the assays is just, it's hard to get them to come into a room and, I, and I've seen them in a room, they still don't do the interactive discussion, right? They don't, they're not using the machine learning platforms that, that I've seen to really bring together the understanding, which would then go to being able to segment the population. Because I think half the failures are, we might not be sub-segmenting the population in the right ways. I think that's spot on. I mean, the ability to phenotype the population appropriately, because a phenotype is still usually determined by a person, you know, and that's a physician who's well trained, but yet there's nuance, and especially in diseases like Alzheimer's that are highly nuanced diseases in different states. And so I agree. And I, I made the comment earlier about you still have to get the patient population to study, and you have to make sure you've properly identified that population. So let, let's jump back here and, and, and switch to a different gear. It's that the story of Resolve, the story of Kyogen, your personal story, they're somehow all intertwined. I feel like we know a lot of the same people that caused this intertwining to happen, but, but you know, how, how did you, the, between the startup and you becoming CEO, because you were an inscriptor and I think that was a pretty good gig. Yeah, um, <laughs> so how did this, how did this come, come about? Yeah, no, so, um, it's a great question. So, you know, again, I was in a script, it's a fantastic company of just amazingly talented people, um, working on some really cool technology that is going to drive sustainability in a way we've never thought of before. Um, and so for me to lead that, obviously we have a pretty compelling opportunity here. And uh, this story started back in 2016 at Kyogen when we were looking at trying to come up with some really unique signs to solve this spatial challenge. Um, we brought together a team of brilliant scientists who, uh, in essence, their only job was to figure out how do we create tools to really elucidate spatial context. Um, that started in 2016. We worked together as a, as a team to, uh, to develop that technology. I stepped away for two years to uh, go to Boulder, Colorado and, and uh, stand up in Scripta. Um, uh, back in 2020, uh, Per Schatz, the former CEO of Kyogen and my co-founder of the business, said, we got a unique opportunity here, Jason, to build something really special. And, you know, it was one of those things, Harry, where I remember, you know, of course, we were all locked in our basements during the 2020 time. And uh, I remember having the conversation with Perrin, walking upstairs to, uh, to talk to my wife, Adeline. I said, I think we're moving back to Germany. I think we're going to <laughs> kind of try. <laughs> and she said? And she said, hell yeah, let's make that happen. And so, oh, okay, good. Yeah, it's... Um, you know, Germany is a very special place for, uh, for my family. You know, we lived here for five years the first time. Uh, my children, when we moved to Germany, we made the choice to live in Germany like a German. We uh, have amazing friends here and our children went to school. Great, uh, great school here, uh, public schools and speak German like native Germans. And, you know, we really discovered the heart of a, an amazing country and just gracious people and great scientists. Um, you know, we're starting something unique here. There aren't a lot of startups in Germany. The German startup culture is a, is a very different culture than in the United States. And as I say about a lot of things, if we could meet halfway and be the perfect world, you know, to give you an example, when we're raising money for Resolve, we'd speak to American investors and it would be, don't you need more money? 
And we'd speak to European investors and they'd say, why do you need so much money? <laughs> and so, so if you could meet halfway, sometimes the over exuberance of just throwing money at problems versus the conservative, well, you know, let's do this incrementally and so on. You know, when we started Resolve, we had a choice to make. Do we bring the business to the United States or do we grow the business in Germany? And we had a lot of discussion around that. And you know, for me, it was a very obvious answer. The answer is we take advantage of both worlds. So at Resolve Biosciences, our corporate headquarters is in Germany and our product development center of excellence is in Germany. Because let's think about what our core technology is. It's molecular biology cooked to automation and engineering with optics and software. So I think we can all agree that the best physicists and optical engineers in the world reside within 500 kilometers of where we are right now here in Dusseldorf, Germany. Just amazing talent and companies that have created huge industries such as Zeiss and Leica and so on are all based in, in Germany, right? And that goes yep. to you know, the German engineering, German physics, optics, and so on. Great molecular biologists. We've got amazing academic centers across Europe, EMBL, so on and so forth, that develop amazing molecular biologists. And when it comes to our you know, computational abilities, that's a global skill set. I've got right. you know, great developers in Eastern Europe, I've got great developers in Western Europe, and great developers in the United States. We're opening our office in the United States in San Jose, California, in the Bay Area. And one area where the US has excelled past Europe is the softer side of science. So the marketing, the commercialization, the brand development. So we're gonna put our feet on both continents and really use those pillars of excellence. North America will be our commercial headquarters of our business where our marketing and brand creation and outbound marketing and content creation efforts are gonna reside. And Europe will be our center of excellence for product innovation and product development. And so we're gonna really be able to harness say both you know, amazing capabilities that each region brings to us. Yeah, I, I, you know, whenever I'm talking to different companies and they're talking about where they're gonna be geographically, I mean, that, that people, people don't give that enough thought as much as they, I think they should because there are cultural differences yep. and that can really hurt you. Sure. Um, if you don't understand these little nuances, um, yeah. I mean, I can tell you the difference between being in Canada and being here, big difference, right? Um, and people think, well, no, but it's right there. No, it's actually not right there. It might as well be in a different place. Yeah, um, yeah. Even more extreme, I'll say the difference between being in Southern California and Northern California. I mean, oh. it's a state, but, but it's very, very different. I've lived in San Diego and in the Bay Area multiple times. And the difference between the, the regions is, is significant. Very yeah, significant. yeah. No, I grew up, grew up in Northern California. And when I would say to someone I was from California, and they'd be like, oh, you're from Southern California? I remember being like, no, absolutely <laughs> not. Don't, don't tell me that. Because, yeah. um, you know, you didn't, you, Northern California had more of a, well, when I was growing up, a relaxed, you know, yeah. yet, you know, we want it to be ahead, at, at least from an intellectual perspective. But, and now the Northern California has gotten a little arrogant, um, thanks to tech, but, you know, it, it is what it is. But it's driven a just unbelievable amount of, of growth uh, that tech has and uh, an unbelievable amount of, of innovation has come from that region, which is why, you know, when we looked at where we wanted to open our, our U.S. office, we were just looked at two areas. We looked at Boston and Cambridge and we looked at the Bay Area. I mean, those are the two areas that, that we honed in on. And we made the decision to be in, in the San Jose, you know, San Francisco area. You know, we know the market well, the talent is amazing there. Uh, you know, Stanford, Berkeley, the universities there just contribute just an amazing amount of, of gifted yep. scientists and computer scientists and developers and so on. You know, both cities would have been great, uh, but California is where we will have our U.S. operations. Well, uh, when do you expect that to open? Um, we hope to have that opening in April. That's our, that's our plan. Very, very so, good. So when... When do you guys launch? When is this going to, 
Yeah, so, so, you know, within the life science tool space, there's a very, say, kind of common dissemination path for, for technology. So technology like ours, which is very complex and capital intensive, it starts with the company refining that technology and then gain, uh, granting access to that technology to early access customers, usually key opinion leaders or thought leaders in particular fields. So we have just completed our early access program where we had 15 institutions involved in that program. The focus of that program is really to understand the application space and how our customers are thinking about using the technology. The technology at that point has exited product development. So we're not really still developing the product, we're right. really refining and, and nudging and guiding the product. In areas like software, you know, you never stop developing software. Software is just a constant development. <laughs> um, you know, we, we put a flag in the, the sand and say, this is where the software is going to start. We do a lot of user acceptance testing to understand how the customers are going to use the software and then start to draw from those features that we want to incorporate. Once you've finished early access, you, let, you then move to a dissemination approach, which is what we're in right now. And so for us, dissemination is twofold. Um, our product is largely data. I mean, that is our product. You know, a run of molecular cartography generates four terabytes of data, which is a significant amount of data. Um, and so we are launching a data as a service approach where we will run molecular cartography in our service lab, hence opening our North American facility, expanding our European facility. And at the end of this year, our plan is to open a facility in Asia. So we can begin pushing our data to market because especially when it comes to things like software, we will never develop faster than the community will develop. And quite honestly, the community is going to bring ideas to us that we've never even thought of before as right. far as how to look at the data. So we are going to scale our services to provide more access to the technology. Early access is tough because you have to say no to customers. You have to say, ah, you know, we're oversubscribed, we can't take you in. We're now gonna open up that funnel to bring you in. The second part of our dissemination strategy is we have a number of uh, large advanced institutions that want the workflow deployed at their facilities. So major pharma that sees this as an amazing insight into biomarker discovery and understanding, you know, how do they move the ball forward even faster, talking about collapsing those, those cycles. So we will be uh, in the latter half of this year deploying the technology at very advanced, very qualified customer sites. And then the last phase of dissemination is what I call the democratization phase which is when we then kind of push the button and start pushing the platform onto bench tops of scientists at universities, scientists at nonprofit research institutions and so on. Um, and that will happen uh, in, in the later months. But you almost wish like, I, I've become a believer and I know that this is, you know, sometimes it's a pipe dream, but you'd want this, all these images like Google Maps to at, at some point coalesce into one repository. Like, I understand that everybody wants their own confidential information, but we didn't build the human genome on confidential information. We, we sort of put it together and said, aha, here's the genome, right? Otherwise, nothing we have right now would have, you know, been realized. And everything is built on that, on what was done in those early years. I feel like what you're doing almost if you're going to build a map, you need everybody mapping yep. and adding to the map so that everybody can then benefit from it in their own unique way. No question about it. You know, you and I are in violent agreement on that point. Um, and so hence our urgency to get our data into the scientists' hands so that they can understand the value and the number of insights that come from the data. So there are a number of international consortium efforts underway right now that are commonly referred to as cell atlas efforts, where right. they're using different cells and so on. We want to put the cell atlas in a three-dimensional context. And you know, those mm -hmm. are public repositories. And so, so we have a strategy to engage those organizations to be able to kind of say, okay, you've now done the single cell sequencing, you've done single cell RNA-seq. Now we need to take it to the next level, take that RNA-seq data, which is the, the 
counting of the transcripts in a 2D kind of planar effect. Let's now blow that into a 3D effect. Let's correlate our visualization of the transcripts with the digital readout of RNA-seq. And this collaboration that I spoke of with this major pharma company in Alzheimer's, we did that in their, their Alzheimer's mouse model where we correlated all of the single cell RNA-seq data they've been accumulating over the last five years and mapped that to three-dimensional spatial single molecule fish data. And it was a beautiful study because we showed a, a correlation in R squared of 0.997 to the RNA-seq data to our visualization of the transcripts. And then we added the three-dimensional context very importantly, at subcellular resolution, where you can actually see structures within the cells. And so it was just this, you know, it was one of those kind of moments where you get goosebumps. You're like, holy smokes, this is, I mean, we knew it was good, but this really showed us how good it was. Well, I'll, I'll look forward to that, uh, to that paper when it, you said it's, it's on its way for publication. We're, we're, we're reviewing the manuscript now, so it's an iterative process and it's a major pharma, so you know they're embargoing. Oh, uh, yes. <laughs> Well, when it's out, you can you can send me a copy. But um, sure. Jason, it's been great to talk to you. I'm I feel like we could talk. Knowing the last time we talked, we could probably talk for hours uh, about these things. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I'm sure that you'll we'll have you back on the show when we get to the next iteration. Um, and I, I'm I'm looking forward to talking to to Richard on on Monday too. I the Richard Fox that you introduced me to. Mm -hmm. um, Maybe yeah. next time we can get, you know, what we should do is we should, we should get Pear to come on the show with us and, and, and do a three-way conversation because yeah, right. his perspectives are always insightful and unique. Indeed. Indeed. He is a, you know, I've known Pear for 20 years and um, the opportunity to join with Pear and start this company was an amazing opportunity. Um, truly a, a thought leader and a visionary in the field. And uh, we just have so much runway in front of us. We've got such an amazing team. Uh, and the team is growing amazingly fast. And uh, it is truly an honor and a privilege to be working with them and bring this technology to market. Because we believe that this technology will absolutely have a positive impact on the human condition. There's no question about that. Well, you know, I just, like I said, I'm reflecting on, you know, the what immunohistochemistry opened up to us. Um, and I still don't think it gets the credit that it deserves, right? Um, but I think now with the computational capabilities and the insights that that could provide, and then you can overlay other information onto that, it's changing the, con the context where the persistent identifier is the location, but then everything that's happening around it is what really puts it into context of what's happening in that Absolutely. Cellular dynamic. Absolutely. So great talking to you, and uh, I look forward to keeping you in touch. Absolutely. Thank you, Eric. Really appreciate it.